Good morning, everybody. My name is Jeremy Lasitza, and I'm Director of Innovation and Volunteer Engagement. Since this is now the fifth in the series, I am not going to do my regular <laughs> spiel it, because you could probably do it better than I can by now since you've been joining us for this time. What I really want to do is thank Dr. Durfler. Um, just so y'all know, when all this happened in the pandemic and we closed the offices, we were scrambling for programming. I called Dr. Durfler and I said, can you help me out? Is there a program we could run virtually? And the only problem is I have no budget. Don't know what's going on. And all he said was, tell me what you want and what I can do. Which brings us to this event and the last five weeks. Um, so I really have to thank him a great deal um, for being here. And I'm we're already planning another series uh, of outreach. Uh, the other thing I want to say is to thank all of you for being here and supporting us and uh, supporting me. You know, I get paid per person that joins. <laughs> so, um, no, but uh, I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful and happy that I work for just an incredible organization like the Jewish Federation. And I'm gonna shut up now and uh, turn this over to Dr. D and take us to Masada. Thank you so much for being here. Here we go. Hi guys. Good morning. And, oops, where did it go? There we go. <clears throat> because we uh, had so much material and because uh, we ran out of time, we're going to be talking about uh, a fifth installment of World Heritage Sites in Israel. And uh, this one is probably one of the most important uh, spiritually, archaeologically, emotionally, uh, psychologically uh, for Israel, the site of Masada. And it's located on the map at number 10, but that's not number 10 in importance, just number 10 in terms of its location. Dr. D, I don't see the, your screen. You don't see the screen? I do not see your screen. Does anyone else see the screen? No. 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 Okay, hang on. That's your email. There we go. Yes. You got it now? No. No. I have your email. It's what? your Google email. That shouldn't be there. <laughs> hang on a second. Uh, new share. There we go. Hey. Hey for you. All right. There we go. Okay. Well, apparently somebody hacked my email. No, <laughs> just just kidding. Uh, but you heard what I said before, so that's what matters. We're going to be touring Masada, above and below. And Masada is this mountaintop monolith that gained importance under the rule of King Herod when he would build a magnificent winter palace resort and get away from it all location uh, for the frigidly cold summer months on top of the mountain when it was 130 degrees at times. It rises over 100 meters, over 320 feet above the Western Valley in the Judean Desert Mountains. But on the Dead Sea side, it rises well over 1,300 feet uh, down to the Dead Sea Valley itself. Uh, the summit of Masada, as you can see from the aerial photograph on the left, is sort of like a rhomboid. 600 meters north to south and 300 meters east to west. It is an isolated mountain in the Judean Desert Mountain Range or the Dead Sea Mountain Range. 
So it makes it a perfect location uh, for defense, for protection, for isolation. And this is why King Herod would choose it directly along the shore of the Dead Sea. The first exploration of the site came in the middle of the 19th century. An, Eng an Englishman by the name of Captain Charles Warren was the first to ascend the mountain in modernity. Uh, he was part of the Palestine Exploration Fund coming out of England that would seek to identify ancient archaeological sites, both biblical and non-biblical. Following on his footsteps in 1875, Claude Condor of the École Biblique, uh, a French pilgrim, explorer, and scholar, uh, would be the first one to publish the plans of what he saw on the mountain. This would remain basically unchanged until around 1960. And if you look at the aerial photograph on the right, this is perhaps the same view that Claude Condor would have uh, in the 1870s, because this is a pre-excavation aerial photograph of the mountain. Many of the buildings after their abandonment in the first century of this era simply crumbled and the walls remained on the surface of the site, gathering dust, uh, crumbling and eroding, but with nothing being built on top of them, they simply sat on the surface. And as you look in this picture, to the upper right of the picture, you're looking north, the Northern Palace is up there. On the left-hand side of the picture, right in the center, is the Western Palace. And you can see how before even a single shovel was put into the ground, the walls could still be easily seen. Basically then, it was a very easy excavation. You just had to do some light vacuuming and dusting to clear out the site. And it would be under the direction of the Hebrew University's Institute of Archaeology and its chairman at the time, Yigil Yadin, who would carry out the archaeological research. And it would be the first to usher in a new wave when it came to archaeology. This new wave was in terms of methods and techniques that would be used. In the 1960s, the Israeli government was under considerable financial stress as Israel was seeking, even after a decade and a half, to fully establish itself as a modern state, facing all of the obstacles of new statehood, but then also all of the obstacles uh, that faced it in terms of a hostile political and military environment. So the state couldn't afford to carry out major archaeological research and pay for it. So in the early 1960s, the notion began to pick up steam of having the volunteer excavation. In this instance, then, volunteers of all walks of life from all parts of the world would then gladly pay money to take part in the excavation, thus funding them and thus allowing them to proceed. Uh, a colleague and friend of mine who has long since uh, passed on, Anson Rainey from Tel Aviv University, wrote an article that he called Ancient Compulsory Slave Labor Gangs in, in Israel. Uh, we simply retitled it and called it Compulsory Slave Labor Gangs in Modern Israel. And it was a parody on modern archeological research in the volunteer process. Here you can see Yadin then in the excavations that were carried out between 63 and 65. These were year-round excavations. They were not seasonal excavations. So thousands of volunteers over the course of three seasons, uh, three years worth of work, came to the site, lived in the excavation camp that you can see at the base of the western ramp, uh, and then would participate 
uh, in all aspects. Uh, every morning, they would walk up the Roman ramp, which is about a 25 minute walk uh, to ascend to the mountain and then carry out the excavation work. But supplies and equipment were often ferried to the top of the mountain by helicopter, as you can see in the lower right hand picture. Also being only 17 kilometers away from the early development town of Arad, which was only founded in 1962, it was easy to bring out foodstuffs and supplies on the road that was only about 10 miles long. Over 5,000 volunteers would take part in the excavation at Masada, coming from 28 countries. And in February of 2014, in England, they held a reunion for volunteers uh, who had taken part in the excavation between 63 and 65. And you can see then one of the earliest articles about the excavations uh, in the London Observer dated August 11th of 1963. I'm sure many, if not all of you, have uh, been to Masada, but today it's a lot easier than it was during the volunteer excavations and up until uh, 1970 or so. The only natural approach to the mountain is by a narrow twisting path that comes from the Dead Sea Valley floor on the east, ascending over 1,300 feet to the top of the uh, precipice. It takes uh, today nearly an hour and a half of relatively slow, easy, but constant climbing to get to the summit of the mountain. And because it's on the eastern side, this is something that you want to do just prior to sunrise, because you know how hot it gets in the Dead Sea Valley, and you know how hot it gets on top of Masada. And if you are climbing this mountain for over an hour, and the sun is rising to the east, east um, it's just as good as a Schwitzwald. It's just as good as a sauna. There you can see it on the lower right hand side. 2000 years later, when Yadin would begin to fully clear this snake path, he would say, a steep narrow trail called the snake's path winds its way to the top. When you reach the barren summit and look out in the burning bright sunlight, you're overwhelmed by the loneliness of the place. It's a formidable site cut off on all sides by steep valleys. Today, the snake path is made more readily accessible at the very end of the path at the top with a ramp-like approach. And below, you have in most places uh, a railing uh, to prevent you from uh, tumbling down the snake path accidentally. There are four gates on the top of Masada, which we'll be getting to in a moment. But the most important one and the one that has the easiest access is called the snake path gate. And today it's a single room that was lined originally with benches and the walls were coated with a white limestone plaster. The white limestone plaster itself is plain, unadorned, unpainted. However, it was etched before it was finally dry to give the impression of it being a series of beautiful cut and polished panels, giving it a sense of texture and finish, not just as a simple plastered wall. If you look at it, on the lower picture, you can see inside the chamber, which has been restored and preserved today, the original plaster uh, that runs just about four and a half feet up the wall and the original benches, which are at the bottom. It's been roofed over uh, for the comfort of uh, the members of the Rashid Aganim, the National Parks Authority, who serve to take tickets and to run the show. 
but it is from here that the paranoia of King Herod uh, is clearly evident. Herod was uh, very much in fear of his life, and he was afraid that nine out of every eight people were out to get him. And that's pretty much the truth. Herod was installed by the Romans. He was tolerated by the Hellenized Jews, the Sadducees, and he was despised by the Pharisees and normative mainstream Judaism at the time. So he didn't have a lot of friends. And in spite of the fact that this mountain rises 1,300 feet above sea level, uh, the Dead Sea level that is, and rises in a steep cliff around all sides, except for the snake path, he still believed that he needed to put a defensive perimeter wall around it. And running around the entire summit of the site, 1,400 meters in length, uh, you have got a dual casemate fortification wall, an inner and outer wall with rooms called casemates in between. Uh, there were 30 towers that were positioned around the perimeter as well. So if anyone should try to scale the heights, they would be met with a defensive wall rising directly above them to a height of about 25 feet or so. Unfortunately, because of erosion, much of the outer line of the casemate wall has fallen over the edge of the mountain, uh, no longer in existence. But the inner casemate wall remains with the side walls that form the separate chambers within. Here you can see work being carried out by the excavation. And believe it or not, out of the 5,000 that worked on the summit and out of the several hundred that worked on clearing the perimeter casemate walls along the edge of the site, only one of them tragically lost his life. You can see them in the upper picture from the uh, Yadin estate photographs showing how these intrepid volunteer archaeologists would be tied up, roped, and hopefully uh, protected uh, in working in this very precipitous area. Below, you can see a fragment of the exterior the casemate wall that's still preserved and the cleared interior room from the archives from the Adin estate. Even though Herod was only half Jewish, he still had constituents, administrators, friends, and some of his family members who would practice their Judaism uh, come to visit the site of Masada. He was very much aware of that, very much cognizant of it. And because of this, uh, Herod decided that he would make it as user-friendly for his Jewish family and constituents uh, as you can uh, imagine. As a result, Two mikvaot, two ritual baths, were created on the site. One of them was a public ritual bath located along the southeastern perimeter of the mountain, and the other a private mikvah or ritual bath that was located in the northern palace precinct itself. Initially, when first discovered, Yadin wasn't certain that it was a Jewish ritual bath. But here you can see the um, latter photograph of the ritual bath as excavated. It was open to the air um, and the walls preserved to a height of just about four feet. On the left, you can see the restoration and reconstruction of the exterior walls of the mikvah. And today there is uh, an observation deck on the roof of the mikvah, as you can see by the staircase leading up to it. You also notice very faintly running just around the middle of the mountain, uh, excuse me, the middle of the wall, a black line. This black line is an indication of restoration 
and original wall. Below is the original wall built by King Herod 2000 years ago. Above the black line is the reconstruction and restoration uh, to give you a better idea of what some of the buildings, and in this instance, the mikvah, look like. A series of rabbis would come out to the archaeological excavation in 1964 or so, and they would look at this series of pools, and they would come to the conclusion immediately that it was a Jewish ritual bath, a mikvah. According to halakhic law, the basic immersion chamber should be seven hands by seven hands by seven hands in size. Um, and so you can see in my picture on the right hand side, if you can see me, you're talking about seven hands up and then seven hands over and then seven hands cubed. Now, it also says according to halakhic law, it's supposed to be a pure water every time that it's used. But how do you do this in the desert, especially when you don't have purified water all the time and water can't be piped in? So basically what Herod and his religious leaders came up with was the notion of mixing purified water. Purified water was considered to be rainwater directly from the heavens. As a result, a very small basin was filled with purified rainwater in the winter months when you've got the infrequent winter rains that fall on the summit of Masada. This then would be sealed to retain its purity and ritual integrity. There would be a second basin as you can see in the lower left-hand picture and the upper right-hand side. Don't you love that when archeologists talk like that? The lower left-hand picture and the upper right-hand side. This is the mixing chamber. It was deemed to be kosher if you would take water that had been gathered in cisterns on the site and then mix it with one drop of purified, secure rainwater thus rendering it to be kosher. This water would then flow into the larger ritual bath of the mikvah with the stairs on the lower right of the image. Inside it today, you can then see the black restoration line and the original plaster that uh, coated and made watertight the chambers of the mikvah. That's on the right-hand picture. At the southern end of the site, you have the largest of the cisterns that was used to gather water. And water being essential to our livelihoods uh, was gathered nearly every single drop by the engineers at Masada. All of the major buildings would have plastered roofs and there would be plastered roof drains running down one of the side walls of the buildings. And then in irrigation or canals, the water would then flow to a number of cisterns located around the site. The southernmost cistern was the largest, and it could hold up to 50,000 gallons of water. Here you can see the diagonal shaft then that leads down into the cistern today. On the upper left-hand side, you can see one of those aqueducts or water channels that I've been fortunate enough <clears throat> to be at Misada uh, a number of times uh, in all different periods, uh, all different seasons and climates. And one year in February when I was there, uh, there was a 15-minute rain on the summit of Misada. And in that 15 minutes, because the ground is so hard packed and dry, here you can see water rushing through one of those aqueducts that would have led to the southern cistern. 
but this aqueduct has since been broken and the water simply cascades in a waterfall over the edge of the mountain today. But the ground on the summit of Masada is very fertile. You just go in the summer and you turn over the rocks and it says just add water. But that's in English, Arabic, and Hebrew as well. And here you can see one of those beautiful desert wildflowers that blossom with that winter rainfall just for a few days afterwards. But it's a very steep descent, so make sure you've got your hiking shoes on. Inside, this cistern was cut out of the living bedrock of the mountain. And if you look in both pictures, on the right hand side, you see a square hole where the sunlight comes in. This is the true engineered entrance into the cistern. The aqueduct ran to that entrance. But again, because the fact that this aqueduct has been broken since antiquity, today it's just open to the air. The bigger uneven hole that you see on the left-hand side is a rock fall. The bedrock had faults in it, and because of wind and sun erosion on the outside, the fault in the stone eventually crumbled, and you have this collapse. This, though, allows in a great amount of natural light, as you can see coming in through that ray of sunlight. And I will tell you that if you are there in July, you have to be there just about nine o'clock in the morning to capture that ray of sunlight as it hits the floor of the uh, cistern. It's pretty cool, but it took me a number of years to figure out exactly what time to be there. Here then, on the inside, you have got uh, the rock cut stone staircase that then leads up and out. And then you can see the stone stairs leading out uh, once you hit daylight. 65 total steps lead out of this enormous cistern. Again, it's quite a schlep. As we continue our spin around the mountain of Masada, we find that we come to the Western Palace. This Western palace was lying right on the surface and simply had crumbled and eroded on the surface. Again, to recap in terms of history, Masada would be destroyed, captured by the Romans after a several month siege in 1973, carried out by Peter O'Toole and Anthony Quayle, right? Okay. Bad joke. Uh, but they would only install a garrison, a small garrison of troops on the summit of Masada for about 100 years until after the second revolt, the Bar Kokhba revolt, that came to an end in 132 of this era. After that, in the fifth and sixth centuries, a small number of Byzantine monks would come and build a small chapel and monastic structure because they wanted to get away from it all as part of their religious vows. This would be in existence for about 100, 125 years. And then that was it. Masada would be abandoned and not occupied. So with nobody building on top of the mountain, you don't have the accumulated occupation debris that covers over stratum by stratum, layer by layer. And as a result, the majority of the buildings simply crumbled because there was no maintenance. This Western Palace was Herod's public palace. It's the, the location where he would have private audiences with guests. There were also a number of small apartment rooms this is where he would put them up. And uh, in addition, 
to give them all of the luxuries and amenities necessary, he also built a Western bathhouse complex within the Western palace itself. And it was built immediately adjacent to the Byzantine gate built in the fifth century that is right at the top, right at the summit of the Western Roman ramp. Here you can see the aerial view after excavations by Yadin in 64 and 65. It was an enormous palace complex. Can you imagine? 4,000 square meters. It's, it just boggles the mind in terms of its size. And we will see in a moment, it will boggle the mind in terms of its lavishness and luxury with regards to its bathhouse complex. On the lower right, you can see the buildings as cleared and excavated. In the upper right, you can see the plan. It was a typical Roman style fortress villa complex that had a central courtyard open to the air and that the innermost series of rooms surrounding it all opened into this courtyard to allow light and air into these inner rooms. The entry was of roughly hewn limestone blocks and these then would be covered with this limestone plaster. Again, there were benches that ran around both sides, all sides actually, of this entry hall, a vestibule. And here you can see in the process of being excavated in the upper photo and the way that it looks as preserved today in the lower photo, the way that this limestone plaster was scored to look like beautiful cut marble panels. We will see this all over the site. Herod was a cheapskate. Herod wanted everyone to think that he was using marble to make his lavish palaces and structures, uh, showing what kind of a wealthy man he was. But in essence, he saved his money and he went to Abu Home Depot to get the cheapest building activity materials he could possibly imagine. But what his architects and artists did was to create plaster layers that then would be painted in fresco work to look like the veining of marble panels. And when seen from a distance, that's what they look like. The Western Palace also had a series of storerooms associated with it. And these were all along one side of the uh, four sides of the square. One of the rooms was over 70 meters, 215 feet long. And then there were three other smaller storerooms that all equaled about the same length, as you can see in the plan in the lower right. In the center, again, was the courtyard, which is in the lower portion of both of the photographs that you see. Adjacent to this open air courtyard was uh, a throne room. No, we, this isn't the bathhouse yet, okay? That's a different throne room. Oh, come on, that was funny. Uh, I can see you're all laughing or not. Uh, this is where Harris <laughs> would entertain his royal guests. It was open to the courtyard and the roof then was supported by two stone drum columns facing the courtyard as you see in both of these photos. But this also shows you the, uh, the cheapness of King Herod. Instead of using marble columns or single monolithic stone columns, carved out of a single block of stone from a quarry, he chose to use drums of columns of limestone, and then he would plaster them over to make them look like monolithic columns. However, this chamber also would be beautifully plastered 
beautifully covered uh, with paneling that looked like marble. And if you look very carefully, you can see the original plaster, but you can also faintly make out the black line of the walls then that are raised in the restoration and reconstruction of the site. Then we come to the bathhouse complex. This has got the original throne room, right? Okay. This is where Herod's guests would bathe and relax uh, in all the glory of a traditional Roman bath. However, it's in the middle of the desert. Um, and this shows you the kind of ingenuity that the engineers would have. It had changing rooms. It had a frigidarium, the cold room that you would first come to with a cold water bath. Then it would have the tepidarium, the warm room that would allow you to make the transition until you got to the caldarium, the hot room, also referred to as the hippocaust. The floors were beautifully preserved with multicolored mosaics. In the lower right, you can see it just after the excavation. But again, in accordance with Jewish tradition, there are geometric and floral patterns on the mosaic, but no signs of any kind of representation of humankind going back to Deuteronomy and not having any graven images before you. Also in Exodus chapter 20 with the Decalogue. Today, after restoration and preservation, uh, a second floor walkway has been put in by the uh, National Parks Authority to allow you to view uh, the mosaics and the chambers in all their glory from above, as you can see in these two pictures. The intent is so that there will be no potential damage to any of these 2000 year old mosaics by visitors. However, it never ceases to amaze me that I'll look down and I'll see candy wrappers. One year I even saw an apple core down there. Another time I saw the lens cap of a camera. <laughs> no matter how you try, people are still clumsy and th or they can't find the garbage can. But here you've got two different images. The upper image shows you the work that was being carried out um, by the zealots during the first Jewish revolt against Rome in 63, or excuse me, 66 through 73 of this era. With over a thousand people on the summit of Masada during the revolt, in a space that was probably created for only a hundred maximum, the zealots then created smaller bathtubs in the bathhouse complex, which you can see built onto the floor of King Herod's mosaics, <coughs> excuse me, so that more people could be uh, involved in bathing and cleansing. And here you can see what we're talking about with regard to geometric patterns uh, and floral imagery on these stunningly beautiful mosaic floors. They are done in traditional and typical Roman style without the human imagery, of course. You can see the Roman wave motif as part of the border, the lozenge and dart motif around the outermost border, and then the Grecian T motif on the innermost portion of the border, uh, running around a central medallion uh, circular that originally had acanthus leaves and other floral decoration. Now, again, we can see clearly the two different occupations, the Herodian and the Zealot occupation. Um, as part of my work as an archeologist uh, in 2001, uh, I was uh, contracted with my group of uh, students to uh, clean the bathhouse and to work on some touch-up restoration. 
uh, of the central mosaic. And uh, this is what we were involved in. Uh, if you notice on the lower right, there is a young lady there who at that time was only 16. Uh, that's Jessie, Jessie Sheslow, my daughter. And you probably all know her from the Federation. Uh, she was tasked with cleaning the beautiful central medallion of the mosaic floor. And there you can see it in all its stunning glory. But I do have to warn you, <laughs> this is the last time she's ever cleaned a floor in her life. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just kidding. Just kidding, Jesse, if you see this on record, on the recording. Just kidding. As we swing around the site, sorry, I still think it's funny. Um, we come to the synagogue at Masada. And initially, this building wasn't there uh, when Herod originally designed the fortress. The question though is, was it added on by King Herod um, as a secondary phase? Or was it added and remodeled by the zealots during the first revolt? And unfortunately, I can't give you an answer for that. But here we can see clearly in the aerial photograph after excavation, the black and white one in the lower left, the casemate wall, the fortification wall that ran around the site. And now we notice that this synagogue building was built into the casemate wall and then expanded into uh, the main chamber of the Beit Knesset, of the synagogue building. Could this be another sign of King Herod's cheap skatedness when it came to building? He saw that there was already an exterior wall as part of his casemate wall. He saw that he could simply break into the casemate opposite an area along the outer perimeter that was a steep direct drop for over 100 feet before it sort of gave you a foothold further down. And then he just expanded the building for his Jewish constituents. Here we can see it after restoration from the watchtower inside the, cit the citadel uh, and the restoration of the synagogue today. Here you can see it in its latest phase. You can see the main chamber, which is almost square, measuring 12 by 10 meters in size. And then adjacent to it, as part of the interior of the casemate wall, we can see a smaller chamber uh, that was added uh, as part of the interior wall perhaps as a ritual chamber or vestment chamber with the expansion of the main synagogue chapel. Again, the drum columns were used to support the roof, but one of them in the floor just opposite the one, two, three, four, five tiers of seats appears to be a platform or ba platform base that was used for the Bama, where the service would be conducted. Here clearly now we can see in the upper photo the black line of restoration, and we can see that the beautiful stone benches have been restored with regards to the plaster uh, seating. You can also see the central column there that probably was the base for the Bama platform. And then notice the black line behind you. As excavated in the space between the walls of the casemate that would be reutilized in the later phase of use of this building as a synagogue, it appears that this chamber was turned into a Geniza into a storage room 
for old religious items uh, that have been damaged or are no longer usable. This small chamber measured three and a half by five and a half meters. Found beneath the floor were fragments of old scrolls that had been damaged. Again, as ritually burying these religious items uh, because they are still considered to be sacred and sanctified items. Once they were buried in these pits beneath the floor, the floor was then, the pits were filled and the floor would be reconstituted. This is what it looked like up until the 21st century, uh, just about a decade or so ago. Here you can see some of the fragments uh, that were discovered. Samples of the book, fragments of the book of Psalms. And on the left, you've got Psalm 85, verse 1. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You did restore the fortunes of Jacob. You did forgive the iniquity of your people. And on the right, you can see a fragment of the book of Ezekiel and chapters 35 through 38 that discuss the story of Ezekiel and the dry bones. Others were discovered as well, but again, smaller fragments. But today, the Israeli government, the National Parks Authority, have all teamed up. And the Geniza has been enclosed. It's been roofed over, a glass door put on it, and yes, a portable air conditioner put inside. Why? Because ever since 2014, the Israeli government has contracted with a sofer, a scribe, to write new Torah scrolls in the remains of the Geniza on the summit of Masada in the synagogue. And I can't tell you how way cool that is. Um, and so far, it's my understanding, because it takes just about a year to hand write a Torah scroll. Four of them uh, have been completed. The fifth one is taking a lot longer, in part because of the four-month lockdown and five-month lockdown now in Israel in terms of the coronavirus. Uh, I don't even know if there's a scribe there now who has begun it again, since Israel is beginning slowly, slowly to reopen. But today, this is another link with our past. Also found in the debris was an ostracon, a fragment uh, of pottery that has writing on it. And here it says, Maser Kohen, the priest's tithe in Herodian block script of Hebrew. Then we come to the Northern Palace, an engineering marvel that uh, defies gravity in more ways than you can imagine. It is a three-tier palace that plunges nearly 140 feet down the northernmost point of this boat-shaped mountain. Here you can see it on the left, and then on the right as reconstructed, envisioned by the artist in 3D. But this shows you more of King Herod's paranoia. He chose to isolate the Northern Palace from the rest of the mountain as if people were gonna break onto the mountain and capture it. He wanted to be secure in his castle keep, in his citadel. So he would build a massive stone and plastered wall that separated the Northern Palace from the rest of the site. But it was self-sufficient. It had its own water supply, its own cisterns, it had its own pantry, a really big pantry of storage rooms uh, for supplies, for foodstuffs, and it had its own regular bath and ritual bath. But immediately outside the complex, there was a large private building that was discovered. And due to its location and its size, Yadin and others believed that it may have in fact 
in the house that was commandeered by the leader of the rebellion, the zealot leader, Elazar ben Yair, uh, also known as Peter Strauss, uh, to use as his headquarters for his family. It today has been restored and preserved by the National Parks Authority. And there you can see one of the members, uh, <coughs> Ronit Manor, uh, involved back in 2006, I believe, uh, in terms of replastering the remains of the columns of the outer courtyard of this building. Just within this enclosure wall in the Northern Palace were a series of storehouses in two distinct blocks, all built with um, common walls in between. Uh, that was located just to the south of the Northern Palace complex. Here you can see these long rooms, only three and a half meters wide by over 20 meters long. Uh, some of them being cleared, preserved and restored, others being left exactly as found after 2000 years, uh, never being excavated and never being cleared. Uh, so who knows what uh, archaeological artifacts and wonders and storage jars still remain on the floor of these chambers that haven't been excavated. But this is the way to do it, to leave areas unexcavated perhaps for future generations of archaeologists, but also to show you the before and after of our process. Josephus would describe these storehouses when he came to Masada during the revolt and during the siege that would be laid in the year 72-73. For here have been stored a mass of corn, ample, amply sufficient to last for years, abundance of wine and oil, besides every variety of pulse and piles of dates. Although from the date of storage to the capture of the place by the Romans, well nigh a century had elapsed. And these dried goods, like the dates, were still beautifully preserved even to this very day for those areas that still had some of the uh, organic materials. Here you can see in the process of uh, restoration and preservation, the work that was carried out in the late uh, 20th and early 21st centuries. And from there then, we move to the palace itself. The Northern bathhouse is just north of the adjacent storerooms. It had an outer courtyard with a stunningly beautiful geometric pattern mosaic floor. And it was then led, you were then led into the traditional Roman bathhouse complex. The first changing room that you came to was called the Apoditarium. And it was beautifully decorated with geometrically patterned mosaic uh, fresco panels that were painted to look like um, marble pan panels. And here you can see some of it beautifully preserved today, uh, surrounded by modern plaster. You can also see then the remnants of one of the beautiful mosaic tile floors. Let's see, do we get any closer here? There. But this is an archaeologist's dream because you can see the building construction techniques of laying a mosaic floor 2,000 years ago. All of the mosaics were triangularly shaped mosaic blocks. Because some of them were robbed in antiquity by the zealots, what you see is the negative of those blocks because that is the Roman concrete that those blocks were embedded into. So you can see that in the lower part of the central picture. You can see the few remaining tiles still embedded in the concrete. 
But then in the right hand picture, you can see once again, the zealots would add a smaller bathtub on top of this very large changing room to allow more people to bathe at a time. These were limestone block walls that then were plastered over on their interior, as you can see in the right hand picture. The lukewarm room, excuse me, the frigidarium, the cold room, you can see here with a cold bath. And of course, that's all relative at Masada. Cold water was still lukewarm, as we would consider it today. The tepidarium had a mosaic floor. And this tepidarium then led into the hot room because you wanted to make the transition gradually from the cooler water to the sauna-like condition in the hot room. And you can see then the vaulted entryway into the caldarium. The caldarium as excavated was the typical Roman hot room of any bathhouse. It had a false floor that was situated on top of these ceramic and stone mini columns. They are only about three feet tall. Then on top of those mini columns, there was a beautiful plastered floor laid down. This plastered floor was then covered by a series of pinholes because the steam was forced under the floor and then the steam would rise through the pinholes. But in addition, you wanted to get two-way steam. And along the outer perimeter walls of this hot room, excavators found in some locations Roman ceramic tile pipes. And if you look on the right hand picture in the corner of the bathhouse, you can see in the gap, the space between the plastered wall and the plastered floor, these Roman ceramic pipes that ran up along the wall to the vaulted and domed ceiling. This would allow steam to rise, enter into the domed chamber, and then gently waft down on you. So you were getting steam from the top and the bottom. Here you can see it then after being restored and reconstructed. Notice in the right hand picture, you can see the black line of where the original was. Beneath the floor of this chamber then was an opening to the outside. This opening led into the subterranean area of those uh, ceramic and stone mini pylons that supported the roof. In the process of restoration and reconstruction, here you can see what the National Parks Authority has done in terms of putting in new old Roman tiles and then the plastered wall on the outside. So you can see how running all around the exterior walls were dozens of these plastered uh, over ceramic pipe areas that would convey the steam from below the floor into the area above. Here you can see then on the left-hand side picture, the entrance from a building, a small room that was outside of the uh, hot room. This small room that was in the process of being restored in 2000 and 2001 is where <clears throat> outside the building, hot stones <clears throat> would be burned and then water dumped on these hot stones. Then a servant with a foot bellows would force the steam through the hole and then into the bathhouse beneath the floor for the steam to then rise inside the hot room. So it would go from the outer chamber on the right hand side, which you see from outside, to the hole that you see in the central picture in the middle, 
and this would then fill the area beneath the floor and then up the ceramic pipes. This was all on the uppermost level. From the uppermost level then, you would then find a terrace that was semicircular in size, a lower circular terrace, and then at the bottom, a rectangular terrace. This is the upper terrace. And this is where you would find the residential apartment of King Herod and his family. It was fronted at the northern end by this semicircular terrace area, and two columns would be discovered. Here you can see them partially restored and reconstructed. So we believe that this northern terrace, the semicircular terrace, was originally roofed over. This whole northern palace juts out over the Dead Sea Valley. It is so far out from the rest of the mountain that you have about a 280 degree view from southeast to northwest and around to the southwest of the Dead Sea Valley. But this also means that you are getting 280 degrees worth of wind blowing at you at any given time. So I know for a fact that even in the deadliest heat of the summer, if you have water and you have shade and you have that breeze on the summit of Masada, you can live there enjoyably and uh, comfortably because of the natural air conditioning that blows. And so here you can see the remnants of this upper level where you see in the lower picture, A is the apartment complex, and then B is the semicircular terrace in the upper picture. Remember Herod and his paranoia? Well, Herod would uh, not want anybody from outside of Masada looking at him from hundreds of meters away to see where he was. I mean, that's the ultimate in paranoia. No, you did not have a marksman who could shoot an arrow a thousand meters as a sniper to get him, but he felt that they could. So what did he do? He would have his engineers create an internal hidden staircase carved out of the living bedrock that went from one level to the next. You couldn't see it from outside. That's the ultimate paranoia. Here you can see then the excavation and clearing of this internal staircase that goes 20 meters down to the circular terrace, which is labeled C on your plan. And from the top terrace looking down, you can see that the engineering feat of the second terrace is no more brilliant than the entire site. At a diameter of 15 meters, you have an outer wall. And then inside, at a diameter of 10 meters, you've got another wall. This gap, these two walls, relieved pressure one from another beneath the floor of the second terrace so that this whole thing wouldn't collapse over the edge of the mountain. It's an engineering feat. It's brilliant. And today, the Department of Antiquities has restored the floor level on top, as you can see it in the process of being done uh, in these pictures to the left. And finally, a third hidden staircase led down to D, the lowest level uh, from the middle terrace. It was 15 feet below the middle terrace and 35 me 15 meters and 35 meters below the upper. But to keep everything in place, below it all was a massive retaining wall designed to ensure the stability of this northern palace 
that could crumble over the edge of the mountain. The lowest level shows us once again the Roman illusionary style of art because found in the process of excavation were brilliantly colored panels of fresco work designed to look like marble panels. Once again, the columns were drum columns that were plastered over as well. Today, this has been beautifully restored by the Department of Antiquities. This is the way that it looked during the process of preservation, but before the potential of restoration. And this is the way that artists believe that it was a stunningly beautiful, opulently decorated lower terrace for Herod and his family. <clears throat> Here in the corner, you can see something unique as well. And this uniqueness is the notion of a heart-shaped corner column. Both the Greeks and the Romans loved symmetry, loved geometry, loved balance. But when you're organizing structures that are on ratios, like two by three or six by nine, if you're putting up columns in one direction or the other direction, what happens when you get to the corner and you've got to have two columns next to each other because of the balance of numbers? It looks awkward, it looks ugly. So what happens? You create a heart-shaped single column in the corner, as you can see in the picture on the left, which then can be counted in both directions, east, west, and north, south. So you've got the proper symmetry geometrically, but you don't have it looking awkward. That's brilliant. And finally, we have the small bathhouse located along the east side of the terrace. Tragically, this collapsed over the edge of the mountain hundreds of years ago, at least in part. So it would be restored, uh, excavated, and preserved, but not restored, because it's too close to the edge. And nobody can go down there today. It's blocked off from, um, from access, because still today of the danger. And again, I would have to say that this Northern Palace is uh, perhaps uh, the, uh, one of the greatest feats of Roman engineering anywhere in the Roman Empire in the first century of this era. How are we doing, Jeremy? Oops. Yeah, I let you go <laughs> along today. I'm sorry, but that's okay. I got 63 minutes worth. Yeah, and there's still four people listening. <laughs> hey, I've got uh, a question. That's I've four to seven. I've got one question. You said, I never heard that uh, Herod was only half Jewish. Yeah. Was it his mother or father that was Jewish? No, I think it was his left side. <laughs> no. Um, his mother was an Idumean from uh, the southern part of the Negev, blending into uh, what's known as the Arava and Jordan today. So technically speaking, he wasn't Jewish. That, okay, just curious. In, in, terms, in terms of his genetics mm -hmm. and ancestry, but his father was Jewish. Okay. So he would use this on the political stage to try to keep his population at least mollified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, if anybody has a question for Dr. Derpler, please use the chat and I will, let's see. Uh, what is the obsession with the baths? Cleanliness is next to godliness? No. <laughs> um, the, the bathhouse complex in ancient Rome was the gathering place of the middle and upper classes because you didn't have bathrooms in your houses. Uh, in some of the upper class villas you did. But this is where, because you can see the big spaces, 
imagine the sauna that we see in all the ancient Rome movies where, you know, guys sitting around in their togas shooting the breeze. Yeah, you, I mean, that sounds silly, but it was the focal point of societal life in ancient Rome. The ritual bath, the mikvah, is integral to Jewish holiness and cleanliness. So they were two distinct things. And uh, then you can tell, obviously, two distinct purposes in light of the size of the mikvah versus the Roman bathhouse complex. Okay, does anybody else have a question? Nobody in chat? So I am going to thank everybody for joining us on this five part series of World Heritage Sites in Israel. I'm gonna work with Dr. Durfler to bring another um, series um, hopefully in August, July. Can I, make August. A, can I make a suggestion? Yes. I know I don't want your email to get overloaded, but if you guys have a suggestion in the next uh, 10 days or so, maybe you can email Jeremy with your ideas. Well, Gail, <laughs> yeah, Gail, Gail is waving frantically. I unmuted you. <laughs> uh, Morocco. I, yeah. We got that from last week. I know. Yeah. It's on, it's on <laughs> the list. I'm <laughs> emphasizing. It's on the list. Okay. Okay, well, everybody has my email. I will be sending out a link to all of, we have a new webpage with all our virtual programming that you can visit again and share with your friends and family. So again, thank you all for joining us. Stay safe and healthy, and thank you for your support. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.